commerce allow me to go a bit deeper or ma more macroscopically further away uh, to gain a bigger perspective. Last week, you will recall, we had a long discussion, uh, the good one, um, of competing identities. And um, in that context, I argue that it is unacceptable to compare and to contrast uh, the suffering of different oppressed communities. Uh, I said that no one can tell a trans person that the terror they feel in this society is worse or better than an Amazon warehouse workers' uh, exhaustion, alienation, and poverty. The same principles must surely apply to different types of discrimination that involve you know, gross violence. So it, the point I'm making, for instance, is that it is senseless, unnecessary, and offensive to compare the suffering of a Tutsi victim in the Rwanda genocide to that of an Armenian victim during the Armenian genocide, and so on. Or for that matter, it is senseless and offensive to compare a Black American suffering today, yeah, uh, to that of a persecuted Uyghur in China, or indeed of a Jew. However, this is a personal view. Uh, I truly believe that there is one historic persecution that stands above all else. Not because its victims are more worthy, or that they have necessarily suffered more than others. I am not into making these comparisons, but because of its nature. And that is anti-Semitism in general, and the Holocaust in particular. What makes the Holocaust exceptional from where I'm standing, exceptional and unique, is that the Nazis approached the Jews with a mindset of a stamp collector, like a stamp collector that will never rest until he has, usually he, but not always, every single stamp of every single you know, collection ever printed by every, any post office. The same thing applied. You know, they came to Thessaloniki here in Greece, they went to Bordeaux, they went to Italy, and they had a complete list of every Jewish person and they needed to collect them all and execute them. This has never happened before in human history. Uh, the Turkish authorities undou undoubtedly, immediately after the First World War, committed genocide against the Armenians. The French army <laughs> did uh, similar uh, criminal acts in Algeria, the Hutu in Rwanda. But in all those cases, there was no plan to kill every single living and breathing Armenian, Algerian, Tutsi, Greek, whatever, on the planet. And to do so calmly, efficiently, at an industrial scale. Of course, they exterminated alongside with the Jews, the Roma, leftists, the disabled, Slavs, and so on. People that they also consider Untermenschen. But Let's be clear, the infrastructure for the Holocaust was created for the Jews and then was used for other people as well. So it is perfectly possible, I believe, you know, I, th I think that was Wyndham Marais, to say that, um, yes, we do not compare suffering between different people. But yes, again, we can unequivocally say that the Holocaust was exceptional and unique in the, hi the whole history of human inhumanity. And thus, that anti-Semitism, which was the ideological driving force behind that Holocaust, is a cut above all other forms of racism. That's my, my personal view. Now, we can see that too in the fact that uh, it's so easily, easy to infect people with anti-Semitism. With anti people who are not generally racist in other respects. I remember when, as a young person watching Sergei Eisenstein's The Strike. Do you remember the movie? There is a scene where there's a fiery speech amongst trade unionists by a trade union leader against the bankers who are sacking people and communities dry. You know, you remember, I'm sure you have seen the scene. And Eisenstein, you know, being a, a good lefty progressive, the director, has one of the members of the audience, a man jumping up and saying, yeah, yeah, the Jews, at which moment, and the director ensures that the people around him, you know, sort of pull him down and carry him off. Okay. And one of the union members says, um, the Jews set up our trade union. Um, indeed, the trade unions in Greece, and indeed the Communist Party in Greece was set up by Jews of Thessaloniki, by the way. Um, setting that aside. Look, um, anti Semitism is deeply ingrained across Europe. Uh, across the different uh, 
political movements. Um, and therefore, we need to consider it not just as a form of racism, but as a very special kind of racism. Uh, I've used up my five minutes, but Mehran just give me a bit more because I only made half of my point. Antisemitism is an exceptional form of racism, not just because of the calculus of the suffering, but because the Jews are the only people that have been despised both for being capitalists and bankers and for being revolutionaries and workers and trade unionists. Okay, that's half my point. The other half is that, you know, comrades, as a Greek patriot, you know, as a patriot and an internationalist at the same time, I've made it the role of my life, you know, I've spent all my life charging the Greek state with authoritarianism and institutionalized racism. I cannot that, therefore accept the criticism that it is in any way anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. I mean, <laughs> let's think about it. Criticism of Israel is and can never be a criticism of the Jews when the remarkable people like, you know, my heroes, personal heroes, Hannah Arendt and Albert Einstein questioned the very idea of a Jewish state in Palestine because they thought, and I think quite rightly so, in a sense, that, even though I don't have a definitive view on this, that to talk about the Jewish state in Palestine, you need to create apartheid. Because what do you do with the Arabs? Unless you simply create genocide and ethnic cleansing once and for all. Speaking of apartheid, apartheid is another unique crime against a people. It has been practiced nowhere except in South Africa and now in Israel. And I say this in the full knowledge of the charge that I am laying. Apartheid is not simply ethnic cleansing, it's not simply getting rid of the people in order to take their land. It is to use architecture, town planning, education policy, uh, the army, the police, the universities, every vestige of power and state authority in order to create Bantustans in which you put a population that you use as day laborers, okay? You deny them all rights, you deny them anything except a quasi-autonomy, the purpose of which is so that you don't have to deal with them, you don't need to vaccinate them, you don't need to provide health education and so on. This is a civil rights issue, and it's only in South Africa and now in Israel that it that this state of apartheid has been created by the state of Israel. Now, we have a duty to reject the view that speaking of, of apartheid, of the apartheid that Israel is building in the land of Palestine is anti-Semitic. We have a duty to reject the view that speaking of apartheid in the land of Palestine is anti-Semitic. I, I remember when I was in um, Israel some years ago, and I visited the occupied territories as, as well, I was accompanied by Israeli comrades from B'Tselem, the wonderful organization that is keeping the flag flying of anti-racism and of um, solidarity amongst all the people in the region uh, across that land. Those Jewish comrades of mine, in, of ours in B'Tselem, were taking enormous risks with their lives to fight for everyone. They call the policies of Israel, apartheid policies. So I have a duty to defend our Israeli comrades from those undermining them by claiming that speaking of apartheid as an Israeli policy, um, Israeli state policy, uh, is somehow anti-Semitic. Personally, I think that in the last three decades since the Oslo Accords have been a complete catastrophe. Um, our party and me personally, I tabled a question to the Prime Minister in the Greek Parliament asking the question, when is Greece going to recognize the state of Palestine like Sweden has? But comrades, deep down in my heart, I tend to agree with Edward Said, the great scholar, uh, that maybe it's too late for a two-state solution. I don't know. I don't have formed views on that. But maybe now we can only look forward to a unified, homogeneous state where Israelis and Palestinians, Arabs and Jews can live side by side. It seems to me that 
this civil rights line is the right one to take now, but I'm not sure. So to conclude, and so sorry for overrunning Mehran, but this is very, very um, close to my heart. Speaking of my heart, I'm carrying in my heart the Star of David because I know that Jews around the world are threatened by anti-Semitism. But I, at the same time, I adorn myself with the Palestinian flag as a symbol of solidarity to people living in an apartheid state built by reactionary Israelis, damaging my Jewish and Arab brothers and sisters and stoking the fires of racism. The fires of racism, which ironically, always ensure that the worst kind of racism is forged, which is of course anti-Semitism. Thank you.